Back in 2020, the Church of England set an incredibly ambitious target of reaching net zero emissions by 2030. For an organization that's got a range of heritage buildings, big cathedrals, churches in city, urban and rural locations, vicarages, offices, schools, and lots of different interests around the country, net zero by 2030 is a big challenge. But it's a challenge that churches across the country are taking seriously. They're trying to understand what they need to do to reduce emissions in response to their faith, uh, in response to a call of, for justice and solidarity in terms of climate change. They're leading the way in advance of much of our society and they're taking meaningful steps, some small steps, but some significant steps to reduce emissions as quickly as possible. I've been working with a few churches over the last few months, including my church here in Durham. This is St. Nick's in the centre of Durham, in the marketplace in the city centre. And as part of the church vision, the church has set out to take environmental sustainability seriously. And to help take that forward, they've started working with me to set out how to, first of all, understand how to, to reduce emissions and then begin to take actions to reduce emissions here in the city centre. So how should we take on this challenge of a heritage building uh, with fairly fairly poor thermal properties that's lacking in insulation in a city centre location in a conservation area on the edge of a World Heritage Site without any re real space or land outside for external plant like air source heat pumps. So how should we think about reducing emissions in this building and how would we give it a path to net zero? This may be a conversation that, you, that would be helpful to have in your context and if you wanted to talk more then please do get in touch through my website at sb-energy.co.uk. In this video, I'm going to talk through what I proposed here at St. Nick's and what I hope uh, the church could take forward over the next few years. Okay, so I've come home um, out of the cold to record this. It is chilly at the start of December in Durham. Let's give you some broader context about the church. Um, St. Nick's uses gas for heating in several heating circuits. It burns about 135 megawatt hours of gas each year to keep a comfortable and welcoming space throughout the week. It uses about 17 megawatt hours of electricity each year, powering lighting, screens, computers, audio equipment, and some catering facilities. So between the gas and electricity it uses, it has emissions of just under 30 tonnes of CO2 each year, 89% of which are linked to the gas burnt in the building. So that really should be the focus and the priority for what we do in terms of net zero. Let's show you a little bit around the building. It's a city centre location. Most of the windows are single glazed, some are stained glass windows and has a really large volume in the church space. Uh, the boilers are in the underground plant room, um, in the underground boiler room, and they serve a ra radiator circuit within the church hall where you can hear the road outside through the single glazing, but it also serves an underfloor heating circuit in the main church. There's a kitchen, a vestry and a church office that has staff in it most of the week. OK, so that's the context. And at this point, I'd be really interested. How would you approach this challenge? Feel free to comment below. So what am I proposing in giving this church a path to net zero? Well, when we're considering changes to a building used by a range of the community, first of all, we, meet, we need to consider the needs that might vary throughout the week. We need to consider the short and medium term plans for the community and the building and then consider the range of appropriate technology that could be used at this site. So Nix is a well-used building, both for baby and toddler groups throughout the week, um, early morning prayer on weekdays, evening events for students and young people, alpha courses, external bookings, three services on Sundays, a staff team based in the church office and probably other bits and pieces during the week that I don't know about. If you come to church on a weekday or on a Sunday, there will be a range of people doing a range of things. And the church needs to be a welcoming and comfortable space for all those different types of people, all those different stakeholders. And therefore it needs to be warm, often from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. each day. Heating sporadically for, for an hour or so at the time with the existing setup is difficult because they have fairly simple heating programmers and a fairly blunt set of heating zones. But we want people from zero to over 100 to be comfortable when they use the building throughout the year. So does this mean heating the whole space to 21 degrees? Well, ideally, yeah, it probably does, but that's unlikely to be financially or environmentally sustainable. But we can look to provide comfort to spaces that are regularly used before ensuring that heating is provided at a comfortable level and sufficient heat to, um, to larger spaces when that is required too. 
And I guess that's the first step in beginning to reduce emissions is, is, is managing the building effectively. But in reality, this risks playing around the edges. If we stay reliant on gas boilers, providing comfort to limited parts of the building at limited times, we will help reduce gas use and reduce emissions. But as long as we're providing substantial heat using those gas boilers, emissions will remain significant. We need to provide heat in a different way. And I think we can do that in three distinct phases. So first we can provide heat to those places of constant occupation. So the church office, and we can we provide that heat electrically. So remove radiators fed by gas boilers and provide heat using electric radiators. For many that might seem counterintuitive because we used to think using electricity was bad, but with a grid that's reduced emissions by two thirds in the last decade, we no longer need to see electricity as a cause of emissions, but as a tool for reducing them. So in those spaces where, uh, that are occupied by several people almost constantly throughout the week, I'm proposing that, that they should be heated entirely by electric radiators. And alongside this, I guess phase 1B, well that would be to, to install supplementary heating in the main church space and chapel, providing some heat electrically, supplementing the existing gas system, and that would allow the church to turn down the central heating system, both the boiler flow temperature, increasing efficiency of the boiler, and the heating set point, and that'll help us reduce gas use whilst maintaining comfort for users, providing heat when it's needed rather than heating throughout the day to comfortable levels. So my proposal is that we this could be delivered using radiant heating in certain locations, systems directed at people to provide comfort rather than trying to heat the, the volume of the whole church building. A small system installed strategically to spaces that are used regularly could mean heating could be delivered where required and when required. This could include wall mounted panels in the chapel and parts of the church space. Um, and there are a couple of companies that have developed a church specific radiant heating system range. Um, and I suspect that specific, architecturally church specific products aren't really needed here, but a subtle infrared panel placed on a wall or above head height could work quite well to provide heat to small parts of the church as needed. Providing heating to office spaces and supplementary heating to the main church in this way will help us reduce the gas use in the building by, by a small amount and reduce emissions for the whole building, particularly as the grid continues to reduce in emissions. But there is a risk that uh, heating in this way could increase heating costs because electricity is much more expensive than gas. So my plan is that in using radiant heating, that will mean that we can significantly reduce the amount of energy used overall for heating by heating people, not the volume of the church building. And we can provide heat as required rather than maintaining uh, high temperatures, com comfortable temperatures throughout the day. And this should help minimize the risk of high costs. Okay, that would be the first step, the first phase, begin to reduce the amount of gas used for heating onto the second phase. And this is where the context of church plans is so important. In the medium term, the church is hoping to move the, the toilets that serve the church building um, to, to a different place to help improve accessibility. And as this happens, it gives the opportunity to refurbish the church hall. And with potential significant works, hoped or planned, this gives an opportunity to alter heating systems and potentially install a low carbon heating system dedicated to the church hall. So as those plans develop, we'll need to understand the potential for installation of a new underfloor heating system and expanded radiators to be fed by a dedicated air source heat pump. And that would take the church hall off the existing gas heating system, given a step change in gas use at the church as a whole. If those plans don't come to be, if the refurbishment plans are more of a light touch and don't include significant changes that would facilitate changes to a heating system, my suggestion would be to install an air-to-air -air heating system, so similar to a traditional air conditioning system, but it would be programmed to provide heat. And this would be a, lo a low carbon way of heating and would mean we can remove the existing gas fed radiators from this part of the building. To decarbonize the church hall, this is all we'd need to do. And at this point, it no longer needs gas and has a path to net zero. But if the refurbishment looks to improve the building in other ways, we could look to improve insulation um, particularly in the roof on the first floor and then and also looking to install secondary glazing at the ground and the first floor to minimize heat loss and to improve comfort but those steps aren't needed they're not required to deliver on net zero 
Okay, we've, begin, we've begun to electrify heating in the main church. We've removed the gas central heating system from the church hall. What's the final step? Well, I suggest that we can look to utilize the existing underfloor heating system that's 45 years old in the main church and the chapel and provide heat from a large air source heat pump via a heat exchanger that will deliver heat to the existing underfloor heating system. So this coupled with supplementary heating that's already been installed will be able to provide the required comfort and do so in a very low emissions way and a cost effective way. If we can get to this stage, the church would be fully electrified and we will have a path to very low emissions as the grid continues to decarbonize. We could class this now as the church being net zero in operation at, at this point. There are a few challenges to installing this effectively. So first, the external space for a heat pump. There is a great space outside the church hall that would be perfect for hosting external plant. It's unused today. It's in a good location for running pipe work into the building and it's not accessible for the public. And although this platform outside the church hall seems almost tailor-made for a heat pump installation, it would mean we need to improve access and security to allow for safe installation and maintenance. It's also in, in a prominent location that, that today isn't really visible, but would be if it had a heat pump installed there. And that therefore does come with some planning challenges, particularly in a conservation area. So my hope is that these challenges can be overcome with new fencing that hides external plant, but also sensitive to the church setting. But this is a challenge or a risk to this final step and could be a challenge for the smaller heat pump at phase two as well. And on top of this at phase two and definitely by phase three, the church may need an upgraded electric electricity supply to facilitate the increase in electrical load. This is a city centre location with several nearby substations, but if an upgraded supply is required, getting a cable to this location, the civils uh, in a city centre location, it, it's not necessarily simple or cheap. So if an upgrade to local infrastructure is needed, uh, this could be difficult to take forward. And depending on the maximum demand of the existing building and then the heating system that we're proposing, the size of the supply, and supply could mean the ongoing costs for that electrical supply and the standing charge associated with it might increase. So limiting the maximum demand of the system is really important to limit costs in the future. And then that's touching upon the final challenge for any of these works, which is the finances. The cost for installation, particularly that final step, which could be su substantial and could be six figures. There may well be grants available to support this, but many of these grants are likely to require match funding. So, so as a minimum, the church will be looking to spend multiple thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds to install heat pumps and get to this final stage. And to do this would, would have to be a decision not to do something else. So taking leadership in reducing emissions seriously will be costly for this church and for the Church of England more broadly. It's possible from a technical engineering perspective, but could be difficult from a financial perspective. For now, Nix is looking to take forward step one, and that will signal the intentions of the church, and it's likely to do something meaningful for step two. The final step may well come in the future. There are some other things that the church is looking to do that would help reduce operational costs and improve comfort, including reducing drafts at external doors and exploring some secondary glazing um, to some of the less architecturally significant windows. And these will be really good steps that will help improve comfort and reduce costs, but they aren't necessarily required to reduce emissions. We could do that by changing the source of heat alone. The final thing to say is that I'm not suggesting that the church installs solar panels, which might come as a surprise. Solar panels and potentially battery storage would help reduce costs for the church, particularly as we power electrical heating systems and could be a good investment financially in the medium term. They would also demonstrate to the, the community around the church that we're taking this seriously. But solar panels are not necessarily needed to get to a low emissions building. The grid is already clean and will be cleaner in the short term. And they do provide some risk, including a complicated planning process in a city centre location adjacent to a World Heritage Site in a conservation area with a steep pitch on a heritage roof that could be damaged upon installation and a solar system that could make future maintenance of that roof more complicated. So in this setting, my suggestion to the church is that solar shouldn't be part of our plans, even if it could be financially beneficial. 
For many churches, solar panels would be appropriate. They could be roof mounted or installed as part of a solar carport system or, or other ground mounted system. But for St. Nick's in this city centre location, from my perspective, solar is not a priority. Okay, so that's the plan. We should electrify heat over several stages using three, maybe four different types of low carbon heating systems, including direct electric radiators, radiant heating and air source heat pumps, which could be air to water in an underfloor heating circuit or air to air systems. And we could upgrade those parts of the, of the building fabric that are clearly in need of some work. We have some challenges to overcome, but we have a direction to aim at in the medium term. I hope you found this video uh, helpful and interesting. If you wanted to have a conversation about what this kind of work could look like for your church, your community group, your business or, or your building, don't hesitate to get in touch. And if you want to see more of this kind of video in the future, make sure you subscribe to this channel. And you could look to join the growing community of members on this channel. So thank you to the new members recently, Chris, Michael, Thilo and the channel Electric Earth now. It's great to have you on board.